The bench is ready and all we need to do is put it in place and finish off the garden with my chosen plants. We know that our bench is 900 long, that's the seat okay. for our derriers. Right. So, ultimately we'd like to leave a bit of a gap on either side for our legs to go in. Now because this is inside a garden, we don't have to concrete them in. Ain't nobody going to steal this bench. So we're literally going to be stamping them in. So let's get a measurement over here. I think we we make it 700. 700, so we've got 100 on either side. 100 inside. So there's a nice overhang. Don't put the legs right at the end of the bench because then it just looks like a stompy squash thing. Folks, what's most important when you are digging these holes is that they are parallel with each other. All right, we place it in the middle of the hole. The first one is not critical in terms of your spacing. If you had measured correctly and you dug correctly according to your spacing, the middle of the hole should be just perfect. At this point we want the spirit level because we need to make sure that this is level because all your groundwork, if it's not level, well, then you're going to have a problem. Let's just put some soil underneath here. Have a look. All right. To make sure that it's nice and level, just take that off, give it a bit of a tap, secures it well into the ground below. Let's take a look there, Garth. Oh, I'm happy. Perfect. Right, we need to do the sides as well. Lovely. Okay, use your rubber mallet again. And you're just going to pound it in here. Are we level, Garth? Yes. How are we doing? Perfect. Oh, spot on, beautiful. Excellent. Right, first leg is in. Let's move across to the second one. Don't just put it in. You want to make sure that your distance is correct. Let's get that tape measure there again, Garth. Let's check this baby. Spot on, Garth. Yep, that's fine. Last check to see nothing's moved across the top again. Love it I'm in a plan. It comes together. Right, legs are in, secure, not going to move. It's now time to play in the garden. Before we put the bench top on, I mean, they would leave the best to last. Yeah. We're going to put in some cool plants around here. The plants that we're using are for coastal windy conditions. This is important because a lot of plants will not survive on the coast purely because of the salt and also because of the extreme windy conditions. That's why it's important that we follow some certain gardening principles which are going to make sure that our plants will survive. Right folks, we've added a bit of compost into here and a bit of potting soil mix just to adjust the slope a bit because it was a little bit steep, I don't want it going down too much and disappearing off. And now I get to start putting in the plants. So, let's have a look. Garth, what have you got there for me? I've got a nice fern there for you, Tanya. Gorgeous. Okay, let's talk about this little guy. Now, Blechnum is a beautiful fern. Doesn't get very tall, only gets about 60 centimetres in height. Loves being in the shade and loves the tropics. So anywhere where you're hot and humid, this baby is going to love it. And gets a really gorgeous kind of typical fern-like stem, but what's most important is that the stem doesn't get too tall. It's more about the softness and the gracefulness of, of the actual fern frond. So when you're planting this guy, remember, ferns traditionally live in the forests and the forest floors of tropical jungles. So we want to emulate that. We want to make sure that the same conditions are there, which means loads of compost and loads of good mulch. One of the plants I've chosen to use just behind the bench, just to give us a bit more depth, zone it off a little bit, is this gorgeous beast. This is called an Exora, and that is the wonderful flower. Unfortunately, this guy has just started its flowering, and ultimately they form big Catherine wheels of, of flowers, and they come in many different colours. You get yellows, you get oranges, you get red. They're vibrant, they're tropical, they're sultry and they're so easy to look after. You get little dwarf exoras, and then you get the larger ones like this guy that's probably gonna get to a meter and a half. So ultimate growing height will be right up here, and it'll form a nice mound, a nice rounded shrub, which is gonna give us a bit of screening off for the bench. Another gorgeous plant that I've chosen, which is perfect for coastal conditions, are these little guys here. They're called anthuriums. Now, 
These plants, they've hybridized into this new variety, which is the dwarf variety. You'll find them available in many shops and garden centers, sold as a little pot plant. Now remember, if you've had that little pot plant in your home and it's starting to not look so happy, take it and plant it out into the garden in a nice shaded spot. And thuriums just do so well in the deep shade. That's what they love. They love the tropical heat because that's where they come from, right near the equator. So these little guys are just going to do a great job. They come in pinks, whites, you even get a green. But I've chosen this red mixed up with a pink. Going to look lovely. As with all planting, we want to make sure that we've got a higher plant slightly at the back, which is our blechnum coming down into our dwarf anthuriums, and then we're wanting a ground cover which will be able to cover this area. And I've chosen this beautiful little ground cover called Selaginella. Loves growing in the shade, grows like a weed, but don't tell anybody. And once again, needs hot, tropical, humid conditions. If you live in a frost area, Folks, don't plant it. It will die with the first frost and it probably won't come back again. Right, folks, plants have been planted and we're in our final bits. Now, because this is a woodland garden, we want to emulate that. And in all other circumstances, I would probably use pathway, I would probably use pavers or gravel, but because I want it to look just like it is in the woodland, I'm just scattering a bit of bark, nothing specific, just in the area where we're going to be walking, because remember, the Selaginella is eventually just going to grow over it and cover it all beautifully. The final bit is to put our seat on our bench. Oh, God, come test it out. Oh, oh this is nice. After all the hard work, the planting, the making the bench, getting our soil sorted, and finally, this is the reward. And I guess this is what gardening's all about. All about, Tanya. Love it. It's the time when you can sit back and relax and enjoy the labours and, and all your hard work in that special quiet place. Now, if you didn't live on the coastal area and you're still wanting to create something like this, well, there are other options. For the height in the back, you can consider a plant called a Cuba japonica. It has lovely yellow and green flecked leaves, can cope with really cold conditions, and that will give you the height as an option there. For the tree ferns, as an option for that, you could use the indigenous tree fern, the Cyathea dregia. Now, we've seen in the berg, the Drakensberg of Kozilu Natal, deep in the ravines where those plants grow naturally, where snow falls. So yes, you know that it's going to cope incredibly well. Another option to here would be some Liriopes, Liriope muscari, or of course, some grass options. That would also look nice. Other options as a ground cover, which will do equally well in the shade, is a chorus. There's a beautiful short-leafed golden chorus, which will look fabulous in here. And remember, in deep shade, you're wanting to add in some light. So the light of the leaves may be golden or even variegated is the option that you want. If you had to go with dark colored leaves like purples, you're just going to lose them in the deep shade here of the forest. So consider that as an important function when buying your plants. <music> One of our most frequently asked questions is how do I divide something? Now, it's pretty simple. Here I've got a little anthurium, one that we've used in our garden just a few minutes ago, and this is how you divide it. When they get clumpy like this, really masses, you can see that there are loads of them. This would be the same for grasses, it would be the same for daylilies, for um, irises, many of your strap-like plants, also your flaxes. It's a very similar principle, all you want to do just grab the plant gently in the center, just like that, and you're going to open it up. And as you do that, you're going to move it around a bit. As you start doing that, you'll see the roots will start coming apart. 
and by just doing that gently, there we go, it comes apart. And already I've got two plants. What is important is that whatever you are going to be removing or breaking off, because most of these perennials are pretty sturdy and they, they're quite flexible in terms of being able to open them up. All you've got to do is make sure that you've got some roots on it. I mean, here is a gorgeous little incy wincy little plant. You're going to take these guys, if they've got very long roots, like this one over here, quite long roots, you don't need to have to try and bury all those roots into a pot. All you do, prune away some of the roots. This would go for agapanthus, for your irises, for clivias as well. You don't need to have all the roots. Prune them away a bit and then put them into a container. And I've got a beautiful mixture here of potting soil, with a bit of compost, got some bone meal in it as well, just to keep it nice and good. And there we go, is my first little guy planted. I would leave him in here for a good few months, let him settle in. From here, I can then move it straight into the garden. And I'm gonna carry on with these little guys as well. And Garth, good job, Wiki. Well done, Tanya. Till next week, take care of you and yours, and most importantly, happy gardening. Make 15% more concrete from every bag. The Gardener is brought to you by PPC.